it's another monday and we are here on the tracker it's another one of those episodes where we are going globe trotting i have my compass and this time we are going to sweden yes the first time i heard about this young man it was through another friend of his yusuf chipsa sante kotoko player uh, was telling me about how he was convinced by majid waris and ruben ayana to become an agent so i decided that I'd find out who Ruben Ayana is. We caught up with him, played for guys, played for um, a couple of teams out there in Finland. Today, we'll be uh, getting his story from his end. He seems like a foreigner because he lives out there, but I'm sure that his Ghana story is every bit as interesting. Ruben, welcome to the tracker. Thanks for having me. I was, I was digging through your stuff, and I realized that, um, I mean, football for you took off let's say at high school level but for for the uninitiated and for those who are seeing you for the first time today just give us a good sense of where ruben ayana was born um who raised you what schools you attended and how you got to that point and then we'll take it from the Pesek uh points uh, moving on onward um i was born and raised in accra um, but uh, in 98 or 99, I'm not sure, I moved with my dad to Tamale because he was transferred there. I moved there to like 93 and I came back. I went to God's Grace International School and that's about it. With my education, after graduation, I went to Brissette. And then with football, I started with Desideros Football Club. That's where the that's where Liberty Professionals saw me and uh, they signed for their junior team. So it's true liberty, actually. That's how I got to Boston College. Hmm. So, yeah, so I was playing for Liberty Babies while I was schooling at Persec. Hmm. Backtrack a little bit to Persec for me. What is it like in, in, in high school playing football to the level where you get noticed by a professional club? How good must you be? Tell me about that journey, about playing football well, in Persec. It was, it was really difficult because... Um, my parents wouldn't let me go to a day school. I wanted to go to Accra because uh, I saw how uh, Asamoja was combining it while I was playing, was ah. combining both going to school and playing football. Yeah, so I wanted to go to a day school, but my parents wouldn't let me. They said if they keep me at home, I wouldn't be serious. So they took me to a board school. But my dad was very understanding that I love the game. I know how to play the game. So. He had instructed the school to allow me to go play league games on Saturdays. Mm. Yeah, so, I, and you know, Presec is not a football school, so you pretty much don't get to train with people. You do your own short sprints here and there, and that was like probably like once or twice a week, and then on Saturdays, I'm allowed to go down so much to play games. So that kind of helped a bit. Mm. So, wait, so when you were in Presec, the school itself, wasn't really playing like organized football that got you spotted. You were spotted through playing for your coach team. You had the usual inter houses and then inter schools, but I wasn't. I wasn't spotted whilst at Presec. I, when oh. I was playing U12, uh, we had a we had a game. Uh, Kanishi Sports Complex. They organized this Ghana national under twelve against their Nigerian counterparts, and ah. I was. Yeah, I was part of it. And then um, they, we played two games that day. It was, they played against BT International before they played us. So there was a coach at BT International who saw me and asked me to, if I, if I want to come play for BT after my U12. Because, you know, normally it used to be like you go from under 10, under 12, and under 14. Mm -hmm. So I was going to go play for BT International under 14. But three months in that, he moved to Liberty Babies. Well, that, that's the junior side of Liberty Professional. So whilst moving, he told me, you want to come? I said, why not? So that's how everything started. So I started playing for Liberty Babies before I moved to person. Oh, that's, that's interesting. That's some good experience. Tell me about what it was like playing for Liberty Babies. What sort of, what senior players were around Liberty itself as a club at the time? Because we know that was, they produced some really, really big players. It was really fun, actually, because you get to see players that you were watching on TV. Like, I remember watching New Zealand 99, and I'm looking at Derek Watson, Sule, and uh, Mike Asian. All those guys, then you go to this team that they just come there like regular people. 
you get what I mean? So you just get to see these people, and it's kind of a motivation looking at them. And some of them spend some time with us, advising us, motivating us to keep going. So it was really fun. And then the type of football that was played then, that was when Liberty was really playing like good football. Not that time Liberty first. was on top of the, their game. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We were playing good football. And when Atubifio came, he kind of changed the whole philosophy of the club. So the junior coaches were also trying to prepare us for that for that next level. So it was really fun playing. And we were playing on grass. Back in the day, not many teams played on grass. True, true. So, yeah, and we didn't struggle with, like, equipment or whatever materials. We had free shoes. Like, you felt like you were actually playing for a proper youth team. Hmm. So it was really fun. And uh, I would have been mad if my parents didn't let me go play on Saturdays, to be honest. So I was really happy that I was able to do both. Nice. Now, you speak about getting motivation from the guys who had made it to the professional level already from Liberty Professionals. At that point, tell me about when you yourself believed wholly that you could take your football beyond Liberty Babies and perhaps also go professional. What, what point did it click for you and what point did it come, out, come together for you to say that, I think I'm good enough to be on the big stage? I think it was around 2003, 2004. There were times that uh, when Liberty professionals had friendlies and they wanted to rest the players, they, mm. they take some of the young players. It's like they'll pick some of us from the U team. Yeah. And uh, as we were playing, you realize like you're training with these like mature players and you're playing with them in games and you're doing very well. You feel like you're doing very well. The coaches are complimenting you. So you kind of have that belief that I can, re I can really do this. And obviously, since you were young, that's been a dream to always make it to Europe. So to get the opportunity to train with better players, mature players, get gain experience and play against like first division, second division, it's kind of motivates you to want to do more and have that sense of belief that you could really play at the next level if given the opportunity. So it, that was when I realized, like, okay, mm. I need to, I need to believe in myself. Hmm. Now, let's get to moving on to Boston College because I I, I know very few Ghanaian footballers who um, are passionate about their football will get an opportunity to get a scholarship to go to the United States and then can move on to pursue a career from there. How does an opportunity like that come and uh, walk us through? Uh, the, the the moment where you eventually left Ghana and then you began your your life at Boston College. Um, actually, it came up as a surprise. It was around uh, 2004 November. I got a call from one of the youth coaches called Garicha, and he told me you're gonna travel. I said, "What do you mean I'm gonna travel?" He said, "You're gonna go to the states and play play football and go to school." I was like, "Oh." Okay. Oh, I didn't believe it at first, of course. So, uh, it was December, I think. I, you know, normally, like, how did, I forget how you say it. First semester. Yeah. You, you go on break. Yeah, so you go to Ghana first semester. So, I went home. And, and then uh, I spoke with uh, Selastete. Okay. So, he was the, yeah, he was the, the brain behind all of that. He went to this coaching course in America. He met a college coach and he asked Silas, hey, do you know any Ghanaian players who are, who are well-educated, who got good grades and ready to go to Boston College? Because it's a great school. Like, you you, it's, you don't just get any, any other results. And he's, so he, he came down, he spoke to Sly about it, and they said, well, Ayana goes to Perseg, he got good grades, so why not? So that's how it all started. And um, mm. I just kept playing, I just kept focus on my SSE, and then uh, after my SSC, they came down. They came down to watch me play two games. Oh wow! Yeah, so they met with my parents. We had a long meeting, and my parents didn't want me to go at first because my parents were like, "You gotta finish university before you could think of being professional." Mm. But then, yeah, because they were they are all about school, school. Uh, so the coach explained to them, well, he's getting a full athletic scholarship to go play for us and also go to school. So it's not like he's just going to play football. So that's how it all started. And um, 
Liberty didn't try to block the move or anything. They just supported me, like in writing my SATs, whatever, whatever I needed financially, whatever. Mm. They supported me all the way through. So I really owed up to Silas and then Liberty Professions. Wow, that's that's inspiring. Now tell me about I mean arriving in America first, you know, playing in the local on the local scene compared to going out there to play, especially in a division one school. We know that these are very highly competitive slots, even for kids who are born in America. Tell me about how yeah. that is like and how that shaped you onto your next level. Yeah, well, the first year, my first year was all about adaptation. Because that was the first time I traveled outside Ghana. I've never traveled outside Ghana before, and my first time is going abroad, like, I want to say the white man's land, you know what I yeah. mean? So it was all about adaptation. There were some good moments here and there, but overall, the first year, it wasn't just, it wasn't about football at all, just trying to understand their culture, how how they think, school, different kind of education mm -hmm. altogether, because mm -hmm. you've been schooling in Ghana for like 18 years, and then you're in this new environment. So... And the way the coaches were understandable, like they understood my situation, where I'm coming from. So, I mean, there were times that they expected me to do more or whatever, but at the same time, they were realistic about it that, okay, now for him to play good, he has to feel good off the field. So, I got a, an academic advisor. Uh, they were checking out my classes, they were making sure that I was okay at, in the dorms. And then, it was up to me to make new friends, so I started making new friends, trying to understand them with like, like their accent, because I, I, I was coming with a Ghanaian thick accent. They couldn't understand me, and I couldn't understand them too. <laughs> no, it's, it's serious. And then once you understand the white people, they are those that also speak slang. Yeah. You know what I mean? So now you have to figure that one out. So, and the food and... I think that the first time I tasted Ghanaian food when I went to America was like two years in. Wow. So like, yeah, the first two years I was all about pasta, burger, pizza, which is not healthy, but hey, that's what they served at the dining hall. So I had to get used to it. But then once I got settled in, everything picked off. Mm. Like, mm. I, thank God I never looked back. How come you never thought about playing in the MLS? I mean, being in a Division One school, that looks like uh, the most likely path for, for one to take. How come that never um, was part of your journey? It's, it's all about my background. I'm coming from Liberty Professionals. You get what I mean? Yeah. All we know is playing Europe. That's, that's, <laughs> that, yeah, that, that's not my fault. I, I, yeah. I was going to get drafted. I was going to be number two tomorrow. Are you kidding? They, yeah, I was by real Salt Lake. Wow, that, you must have been really good to get drafted number three. Yeah, they, they, he spoke to the coach, he spoke to the agent, but then, I uh, don't uh, no, it wasn't, it wasn't something I wanted to do. I thought, because at that time too, I had met uh, Patrick Mock. Okay. Yeah, he represented Derek, Asian, Sully. Mm. As someone, yeah, most of the guys. So, and he's he's a liberty guy. Yeah, yeah. So I, I had a phone call one random day from the coach that I'm with your friend. I said, "Who's my friend?" He said, "Patrick Moore." I said, "Oh, I heard about him before." Because when you are liberty, you hear these stories. Yeah. And then he goes, "I know you." I said, "How do you know me?" Slam has making me watch your games when you were playing for under fourteen and seventeen. I said, "Oh, this is interesting." So he told his. He, uh, he told me like, all right, so Sly and I have spoken and you're doing very well. So play one more year and let's see what we can do for you in the summer. Mm. Well, if a top agent tells you like that, you're not really thinking of MLS. And yeah. it's not like MLS was like this back then. Yeah, it was, it was nothing I mean? close to this, yeah. honestly. It, yeah. It, yeah, exactly. It was, so people would say like, okay. What year yeah, was this? Yeah. What, what year was this? So, it was 06. Okay. Okay. So I was supposed to go pro in 06. Yeah. Wait, were you but down then, with your college education at the time? No, nah, I was in my second year. Oh. But then, yeah, it was like, if you go 06, you wouldn't, you have to start all over if you want to finish your degree. But if you're in your third year and you go, then you can just finish it all. Okay. Which, yeah, which I did in Sweden. 
So that's that's how it, it happened. And I uh, said no to MLS. And when I signed with guys in 08, in 2009, we went to preseason in Los Angeles. And the same coach, we were sharing hotels. And I had a meeting with them because I wasn't playing much in Sweden. He said, do you want to come back? But I, I really wanted to make it in Europe. So yeah. I said no. And they wouldn't be able to like, afford the transfer fees because I had four years left on my contract. Hmm. Interesting. And you know, with the, yeah. Tell me about the first years as a professional footballer in Europe, right? I mean, you've gone through the mill now. What are some of the challenges, realistically, that you faced? And what are, what's some advice that you can give Ghanaians who are, for instance, leaving uh, the homeland Ghana to go to Europe for the first time to play? It's, it's real competition. Like, in Ghana, we are pampered a lot. We are really pampered because, you know, like, yeah, when you are young, there were some games like I don't even have to show up early. You you even get caught. Where are you? Come, you just sprint once and then they yeah. put you in. You get it. You get in sport because the group of fans love you so much. But when I got there, you realize like it's twenty three of you, probably ten from different countries. The rest from other parts of the country, like Sweden, like different cities. So it's like you get to compete, and then you get to try to adapt. You, you got to learn the language. You got to learn how they talk, how they move. Because if you, if, you, if, you, if you settle off the field, it helps you on the field. Mm. You understand? Yeah. So that is also very important. And uh, I, I was blessed because in Sweden, most of them speak English. So I didn't have to like focus on learning Swedish that much. Yeah. And then there were a few Ghanaians that uh, Gandhi was here before. I don't know if you remember Gandhi Kassini. Yeah, Gandhi Kassini, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've known him since I was 12. I've known Gandhi for wow. a long time. So he was the head kid when I got here. So it kind of made, made it easier because we were hanging out every time. Hmm. And uh, yeah, my first six months was really tough, to be honest. I, I, I think I only played one game. How did, how did that feel? How did that feel? I mean, you were... No, it was tough. It was tough in the sense that that's the first time I've been a bench player my whole life. Mm. Yes, yeah, since I was young till then, that's the first time like I had to really work hard to earn the recognition, the respect of a coach. Mm. And then I had to also, but three months in, I had to also realize like, um, yeah, this is this is a whole new world. Like they wouldn't just give it to you. You have to fight for it, and they wouldn't let me go on loan either. For some reason, they said we know what you can do. You just not doing it. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. So yeah. Now it was really. When, when I was talking to Chips, I, it's interesting you mentioned Gandhi and how you linked up with him and how he helped you to settle down in Sweden. Yusuf made me understand that, look, there's some sort of um, coordination, or if I should say, there's a bond between the Ghanaian players who play in Sweden, to the point where uh, there was even a WhatsApp group to coordinate yeah, everybody. It still, it still exists. Wow. Wow. Tell me, tell me a little bit about that. I mean, what is it like for all of you bonding together? Do you guys have like activities you do together and how has like the entire process of coming together benefited your your stay in Sweden generally? Actually it helped a lot. In in the beginning you kind of wonder okay what is it about? I don't know this person. All I know is the name or something. But it, it has helped like people are close friends now through that WhatsApp group. Mm. You get what I mean? And it, it kind of helps. We support each other. We all watch the game. We all play against each other. So maybe there's one who is not playing or maybe your team is not doing well. Or you get an injury. And and uh, I don't know how to say this and it doesn't sound negative, but most times I brought when you get an injury, that's you alone. You, you get what I mean? You're alone. Like You don't really get that support. But then yeah. you have this group that everybody's checking up on you. And also... Uh, some of them I've had a, I've had a, a charity organizations in Ghana that needed financial help and 
I contact these guys like, okay, so this is what is going on. And I'm trying to get fans. I'm going to donate. So if you really want to donate, you can just chip it. And they've all been wonderful. And we also supported others too. And then during Christmas, when we all come home, you know, these charity games that we play, like in December, we go support. Maybe somebody has is, is playing this charity game for a course. And through these charts, you, you get to know people and invite people and we all go and give support. So that was something great that Chips are really did. And it got us all together, actually. We got to know each other better. And then uh, it's been nothing but love from day one till today. Tell me about convincing him alongside Majid Baris to become a football legend. How difficult oh. was that? What did you guys see in well, him? And, and how did it eventually play out to what we can see today? Well, actually, uh, um, Amati had gone to Denmark and Waris was outside Sweden. So I was actually there with him, you okay. know what I mean, when this thing all started. like Because he had also just moved to guys okay. to play with me. And we lived like five minutes apart. So it started with the whole Amate deal to Denmark. That's how it started. It started with it. And then he told me, well, I cannot tell you details about how it worked out. But then yeah. when he made it happen, I was like, yo, these guys respect you. Because, I mean, it's Chipsa. You know what I mean? The first time I saw Chipsa, I was like, wow. I'm looking at you, see Chipsa right now. And then we build a relationship. So when, when he made it happen, I'm like, Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's up? What you gonna do now? But it was before that thing was before Amate. It was Waris when Waris was having a great season in 2012. Yeah, he was playing for um, uh, Hacken. Ha yeah, Hacken at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So he he and these agents were calling him like everybody wanted to bring him a deal, and I said okay, because Waris was like a little brother to me when he came to Gotham. Right? So I told him, all right. I could be a big brother to you, but at the same time, when I came to Sweden, Chips are really held me down. He really held me down, helped mm -hmm. me settle, talk to me, advise me. So I think it's better that I will connect you to, and you talk, just talk. It doesn't have to be money or numbers or whatever. Just talk. Just see, this is what goes on, and I don't know. So they build a relationship from there. So from there, I, I realized like all these guys. It's chips that they had respect for him. So I told him, yo, these guys always complain about being duped or being lied to by these foreign agents. What are you doing? Like, think about it. So that's how he also started thinking about it. He started helping me. He, and he, he didn't even start as an agent. He just started by being like an advisor to these guys. So I think one agent got to know of it. And realized that okay, for me to sign a Ghanaian guy, I need to talk to Chips. Ah, you understand? Yeah, exactly. So it was like, okay, Chips, I want this guy. And Chips, and and th this is one thing I love about him. He didn't do it for money, or he didn't pressure you. He will advise you, but he will also tell you, listen, there's this, and there, there's the pros, and there's the cons. So you decide at the end of the day. So when uh, when he saw that things were growing and how these players were playing, he decided like, okay, maybe you're right. I could be an agent and represent these guys. And he's done a fantastic job so far. Amati to Leicester, Warriors to France. Uh, he, he nearly got Warriors to England, but unfortunately they didn't work out. In okay, due to Turkey, back to Sweden, Nazi yeah. to Bulgaria. The list goes on. It's a long list. And uh, and he he actually I didn't know I was looking at universities to finish my degree and I was, and one time I visited him he was studying I was like what are you studying he said sports money I said which university he said UCN I said I've been trying to find an university he said what are you waiting for help me get contact with Free, Free Pro Sweden got my paperwork ready sent my transcripts from Boston College and then. By God's grace, I was able to finish last year. So this is like, this is somebody like I, I got to know personally and who has helped me a lot in football and mm. outside football. Mm. So that was the year in 2016. That's when he sent me a text. It's like, all right, I'm going to retire and then I'm going to take this on because I already got three strong guys. So 
we're gonna focus on them and then we're gonna spread out. And then clap on South came into being. Wow, wow, that's that's inspiring. Hold your thoughts there for a bit. We'll take a quick break here on the tracker. When we come back, we'll get into a, a lot more generic stuff. We'll talk about some national team stuff. We'll talk about your own football idols growing up and some of the activities that you love to enjoy outside of football. So stay tuned right here on the tracker. We'll be right back. Tune in to The Point of View this and every Monday and Wednesday at 9 p.m. as I, Bernard Avle, get the right guests, ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you. What is the funding that we need? Do we um, actually sit down and leave things as they are? Or should we get more funding so that we can change how we do business as usual? Um, you know, even if you think of geopolitics and geoeconomics, we are entering an age where China wants to build its own internet and uh, we are seeing an, a new arms race, a technological arms race. To be honest with you, it's, it's politics. Uh, there are different dynamics in politics. I'm sure some people didn't give anything, some people gave some. Uh, it depends on, on, on the people you're working with. Remember, The Point of View is live every Monday and Wednesday at 9 p.m. only on City TV. Point of View is powered by Airtel Tigo Extra. Even our bonus data doesn't expire. You the film? Dial star 111 hash to activate now. Etel Tigo. Life is simple. Imagine if you can get all the understanding on some of the difficult subjects you struggle with in school. As a student, do you feel dissatisfied with how hard it is to figure out the subjects you're learning? Or as a parent or guardian, do you worry that your child is struggling to understand some of the subjects in school? Well, now you don't need to sign up for extra lessons or tutors. Simply tune in to Class Act, Mondays to Thursdays at 5.30 p.m. on City TV. Class Act is a show that seeks to enable senior high school students gain a much better understanding of what they learn in school. All you need is a TV, a chair, your notebook, and your pen. Get clarity on subjects such as maths, English, IT, and science. Class Act airs every Monday to Thursday at 5.30 p.m. on City TV on DSTV Channel 363 and Go TV Channel 182. Don't forget your pens, pencils, and your notebooks and tune in to Class Act only on City TV. Welcome back to the tracker here on City TV. We are still speaking to Ruben Ayana. Played for guys, played for Haken, played for Kupion Polisera. I hope I got that right. The name is not, it's quite a handful, but I hope I got that I, right. I, I can't even pronounce it right, so don't worry. <laughs> That's interesting. Now, just a quick one before we get into that, the generic stuff I was talking about. I realized an interesting pattern. There's a very interesting pattern with Ghanaians, Ghanaian footballers who are educated, typically ending up in Sweden. I'll give you an example. David Akam is one, university educated. Majid Waris is one, university educated. You see if Chips is another, university educated, and then now yourself. What is it about Ghanaian no players idea. with that background and it? all of you ending up in I Sweden? I didn't pay attention to it, so you brought it up. I just started thinking in my head, actually, that is so true. Yep. <laughs> like, I have no idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I think it, um, this this is my my best guess though. Yeah. I think it has to do with like maybe that's the league that really accepts us. You know what I mean? Because mm. if, if you go to school, 
the the so-called big leagues, they want the guy right from the academy, football academy. So when they year that he went to school, obviously, and also the fact that, you know, without an EU passport, it's difficult to play in certain leagues, certain big leagues because mm -hmm. of their foreign quota. True, true. Yeah, so maybe that's a, that's my best guess, but I, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> I try to get attention to it. Let's let's talk about the national team, right? I mean, having mm -hmm. been around guys like Sly Tete, Selas Tete, um, yeah. Essence, the Chipsets, and the likes, what what, did, what does it feel like for you not to have been able to play for the national team or not to have been offered a call up? Um, actually, I've been fine with it. I there were times that I felt like, oh, maybe I could get a chance, but then. What, what? I also I also understood like like the system then that you have to be in a certain league. Mm. Like for my position, if yeah. I look at my position, those who are playing in the black star were in top league. So of course that's understandable. So you I mean you cannot get mad at that. Because that then these are people that I respect. I played against Antonio and in Finland. Fantastic yeah. player. I'm yeah. only when you play that. That's, and then you got Rabi, Rabi, I think a year. I saw Rabi play a year while yeah. I was at Liberty. Another great player. So, I mean, when they, you talk about Jim and Bedu playing for Udinese, if we are quite in Italy, and uh, yeah. you can't, you, I mean, you, you can't get mad at that. If, if, if they were all playing in leagues at your level and they were getting called up, then yeah, you get mad. But nah, I'm totally fine. I respect it. Because I, I was going through your highlights and, boy, that left foot is cultured. Your passing range. <laughs> you, you, you scored one goal for um, Polisora with your left foot outside the box. That's like a, a really deft touch into the corner. I was like, oh, why, yeah, was why, why didn't he ever pop up on the national raid? I mean, does it feel like uh, a disappointment for you? Or it's like, like you said, mm -hmm. you, you're you know fine what? with how it is. I made mistakes in my career, but then I'm also happy with the fact that, because I know if I didn't go to school, I would have had better training. Mm. Like you said earlier, before the interview started. Yeah. Do you know I started like a whole week's training every day okay. at Boston College? Okay. My whole life. And I, I never, you know, in Ghana, when you go to the government schools, there's a lot of soccer competitions. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's also time that you could actually skip school and go play football. But I went to good schools. I can't be mad at my parents for taking me to a good school. True. Right? True. Exactly. Yeah. So in as much as I would have loved to be training every day and having fun, hey, I, 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 I'm pretty sure some of these guys, if they, if they had the opportunity to go to good schools, they would have. Who wouldn't? True. What's the, uh, God's grace, even if you sweat, you get punished at school. Just a sweat. And then you go to Prosec. Yeah, yeah. and Prosec, Prosec, you see all your mates. Everybody got a book and a bag right after school. They're going to study. You really think I'm going to be thinking about football? I got, you, you get into that culture. Yeah, you, yeah. I get, I get to go play Saturday. So it's like, okay, of course, vacations, you get to train every day. But like proper, proper training for like two, three years straight happened at Boston College. So... Disappointment? No. I'm, I thank God I got a degree. I thank God for the education and experience. And I got to play in Europe. So yep, yep. Million, million, millions of kids would love to do that. And sure. I'm, yeah, so sure. I look, you see, obviously there's the disappointment. I, I'll be a liar if I tell you I'm not disappointed. But I also have to look at the other side of it. Though. Yeah. And yeah. be grateful to God that I had this opportunity. That's, 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 that's real. That's real. Tell me about the Black Stars now. Um, C.K. Akono, what do you make of uh, C.K. Akono and his his appointment as Black Stars head coach? What do you think uh, he can do in terms of helping us advance our course as a footballing nation? I was speaking to a friend a couple of weeks ago, and uh, there was something I realized during the last AFCOM, right? I don't know if you guys realized it. Mm. Whenever there was a water break or somebody got injured and they had to talk to the coaches, most of the guys want to see K. 
I, I don't think it's something he, I took so, notice of specifically. Yeah, normally, normally the assistant coach is just sitting down, right? Yep. The head coach is the one talking. But whenever there was a water break, he stands up and you see all these guys walking towards him and he's talking. So I was talking to a friend. I was like, it seems like these guys want to play for him. Because modern football, it's not just about X and O's anymore. Do they want to play for you? My favorite coach is Moreno, but there are sometimes I know that these guys don't want to play for him. Yeah. So I hope that they will be able to buy into whatever he's trying to do. Let's be honest, it's, we haven't been good. Hmm. That's some honesty. Yeah, That's some honesty. No, right there now. Was, there, there, there's, there's, we haven't been good. Like, it, it's not because we are bad players. We have individual quality, but sometimes it feels like we we the players are put in the wrong positions. And uh, I don't know what direction CK is going to take. Is he going to rebuild or he's going to maintain the key guys and try to win something? I don't know his plan. We had a Zoom call with him the other day. I wasn't able to ask some questions because I was late. But then whatever direction is, he should be allowed to do what he wants to do because it felt like these guys wanted to play for him. And that's a big step. If you are able to win the locker room as a coach, it's, you're really doing something good. So let's see. It's unfortunate COVID-19 is affecting football. But I want him to do it. I try. He's one coach that I kind of have a feeling that he's going to do well uh, for the Black Stars. So he's ready to listen from the Zoom call. You see that he's ready to listen. He's ready to seek help. And uh, he got an assist, a good assistant in David Duncan. So let's see. Yeah, well, let's hope he can change it. But if you ask me honestly, I don't think we are the black star players are being used in the right positions for the past whatever years it is. Hmm. Talking about not being used in the right positions, Thomas Partey comes to mind. There was a raging debate about him yeah, the entire course. AFCON. Yeah. Talk yeah, to yeah, yeah. I mean, I still don't understand why we still play him number 10. We, I don't get it. Why is Thomas Pate the best player, one of the best players in Europe? Tell me. Well, basically because he plays well as a box-to-box -box midfielder. He does well as a number six. Exactly. And if you, if you watch Atletico, when they have that low block, right? When Atletico have that low block and they lose and, 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 and they win the ball back mm -hmm. down low, who is the guy that they connect with to get out of those tough positions? Thomas. So why do we keep him up there? If we need you to get us out of the situations, right? If we need you to get, so why do we put him out there? Because now you want him to play with his back against the other, other goal. Are we, not, are we not underutilizing him? Let him play his role. Let him play his role. Because, I mean, I've heard coaches say they want to build from the back. Who is the best playmaker right now in Ghana? Probably him. Not probably, definitely. <laughs> now, think about it. Who yep. is the son of yep. playing top level now? Party. Yep. Yep. He's a starter. He's playing in the big games. We saw him against Liverpool. Yeah, so they Liverpool the guy, most recently. Yeah, Liverpool. Yeah. The guy played with so much confidence. He was a playmaker for that team. So why do we think Thomas Pate will be more of a help to us up there? It just doesn't make sense. And now, uh, mm -hmm. it's like, one thing I say is like, what does the coach want? Do you have, are you ready to bench certain players? Mm. That's the question you get asked. Because I, I heard about they wanting to play counter-attack. Is they did that fast for a counter-attack? Mm. They is a box. Yeah, so are you going to bench the captain of the Black Stars? Those are some of the tough decisions that we expected no, the coach to take. Decide, no, so it's like we speak and we talk about things. You gotta ask yourself: Are you? Is Ghana gonna let you bench Dede? Because you want him to drop low when we win the ball run. But is he that type of player? Let's be honest. Hmm. Is Dede? It's, does Swansea play Dede as a counter-attacking player? Nope. No. That's another. So why why say you want to play counter attack? 
talk to me about. Do we, huh? do we have a striker who can hold the ball? Because you're not going to be for in case because counter attack you get to play long, hold the ball. Yeah, and then yeah, wait for when gets to join into the attack. Exactly, is Jordan a player that holds the ball? Jordan wants you to play and let him go score. So if you have a good two number tens or number eights who will slip it for him, I mean, we just. <laughs> you know, crazy. No, it's crazy. It, 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 it doesn't, it's not simple. It's not easy. But I mean, what's the point of like coming coming up with a system that you, you know you don't you can bench certain players and they are the best. Thing. So why don't you figure out and build a team around them and try to get the best out of them? Hmm. Talk to yeah. me about talk to me about Thomas's um, transfer link to Arsenal and all the. The, the noise that has come with it. There are those who yeah. have the opinion that Arsenal is a, is a downturn or it's a step down no. from Atletico. There are those yeah. who believe that Atletico is Champions League guaranteed every time. What do you think he should be doing? Uh, for me, like, it's up to Pate and whatever conversations he's, he, he, he has. I mean, I don't know if he's been allowed to speak to Arsenal yet. Uh, nobody knows. Uh, I'm not in his camp. I don't know people in his camp, so... I don't know. For me, the only thing I was thinking about is how Arsenal plays and how he might not be protected. That's what I, and, I, and I've had this discussion with Faisal and uh, mm -hmm. other people, and they say maybe Ateta will change the way he plays if he signs Pate. And I said, I hope so. Because for me, I was, I've always been thinking about uh, when he plays at Atletico, he doesn't have to run that much mm -hmm. to intercept passes or win tackles. Because they have that block when they, they protect that middle. Atletico Madrid protect that middle very tight. So he, it's a short distance. In that way, he's able to save some legs to be the playmaker. You understand what I mean? Yeah. But when he goes to Arsenal, who doesn't play that way? And because when you play against Arsenal, doesn't have a tight block. Like it's kind of spread out. Mm -hmm. Meaning, as the number six guy, you have to cover a lot of distance. You understand? Yeah. You have to come of distance. And in the, in the, in the pace of the league, you have to run a lot. So if that happens, what if Patrick gets the ball? Does he still have the legs? Hmm. You know, so that that, that that was my my whole thing about it. Like, if Ateta could guarantee him a system that will work for him, because he's a technical coach. He's not looking for somebody to just defend, defend, defend. He wants you to be a playmaker as well. Mm -hmm. So are you going to help him? Are you going to protect Pate so that he doesn't have to cover a lot of grounds defensively? So that when, and when they win the ball, I need Pate available to play make, and, but he can't because he had just chased somebody for like five minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was my only thing about it. But if he's, if he's allowed to speak to Ateta and they are able to talk through it and Pate feels like that's right for him, of course, why not? It's the premiership. You, everybody wants to play in the premiership. True. Obviously. And I hope, and I, I hope, like, if you sign Pate too, you sign some other good players that could help him because you're telling this guy to leave Champions League season after season to go play Europa or sometimes not even make it. That's a big ask. Yeah. Yeah. But in terms of, I think Uti, Mike Uti, GA, or Gary, one of them made a good point. Like, football wise, mm, stay at Atletico. And I'm paraphrasing, I, I, I can't remember the, the, code, the code. But if it's like, if you want the whole exposure and the end of the game and all that, of course, Arsenal. It's Arsenal. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. I can agree with that. Talk to me about. What do you think we can do to improve the local game down here? I mean, you've been through Liberty Babies. You've seen um, how the local system in football here down is. Having looked at it from where you are now, if you could make recommendations for, let's say, two or three things to be changed, what would you be recommending? One, well, stop the politics. It's annoying. <laughs> That's it. Stop it. It's so... There's a lot of committees in the GFA. Jeez, do we need that much? Committee for this, committee for this. We haven't played coach football for like what? Is it 10 years? Yeah, close Six to. Six years? Yeah. Yeah. Stop the politics. Just go on with it. Go on, let the kids play. Let them have fun. Let them develop. 
if they are able to stop this politics, that's it. We wouldn't have to wait for we are going to this meeting to decide we are going to have a meeting. We are going to hey, just stop it and let the kids play. That's about it. It's, it's a youth league. Really? Do we need that much meetings and all that? And as far as local football is concerned, we need to. I, I always take an example from Belgium and Germany. So Germany before the before 2006, when I think they performed poorly at the Euros uh-huh. in 04. Oh. So they decided like this. All right, now we don't have the typical German kid who is tall and long, where we we could just play long balls and hope for headers. Now we have immigrants who are mixed with these kids. So you got the Ozil, Kedira, yeah, um, yeah, and the even, even the Gerard Asamoah is in there somewhere. Yeah, exactly. So we have to change our whole system of play in order to fit these guys because they are not just tall and have no skill. Now these guys are technically gifted and most of these youth coaches are immigrants as well. Um, what's his name? Um, the coach for Legon City. He's Bosnia but grew up in Germany. Yeah, Barak Terrell. So yeah, so all the, their football had to change. They had to now they had to find out who is the German kid. And that's what Holland does. And then Belgium did it too in 24, 2004. I read an article when they talked about, okay, our football is terrible now. But now we also have a lot of foreign players. We don't have a typical German kid. A lot of immigrants have come in mixed. So we have to change our style. And then they spoke to club executives, like all of you set up academies. And now we want all of you to start playing for three three to get the best out of everybody. That's a question that the GFA is asked to ask. They are with their whole committee or whatever. But I just suppose the Ghanaian kid. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how long you've been following football, but think about it. The last time we had, when was the last time we had a player lit up the whole league? And I'm talking like Michael Lessie. Okay, I'm you're talking, talking about, locally, yeah. That, that's that's like, been a, that's been a while. Exactly. The last time a player actually lit the league was when Haas was high and yep. caught the course. Court. All these players that have come up, they're really good. They're really good, but we're talking about because everybody wanna say Ghana's football is upper. But we haven't really had that in over what 11, 12 years. True. Shouldn't that be shouldn't that be a question they should be asking instead of focusing on all this politics that are so much politics going on instead of the game? I always say this. How do you expect to get sponsorships when you don't have a quality product? Hmm. It's simple marketing. You're not gonna get. You're not gonna get a sponsor. Think about it. You you think back in the days there wasn't like misappropriation of fans or whatever in the in the FA. I don't think it's Natty was the first FA president. But I, I mean, he's the first president to get arrested over allegations. But it's probably a, a existed. But then there was a quality product on the page. That's why ABC, yeah. Ken Pharma, MTN. Because they saw the stadiums were all full, but the product was there. The product will sell itself. But we are we we are so focused on trying to do. I don't want to say the unnecessary, but the irrelevant stuff. Meanwhile, yeah, you got players complaining about salaries for the past six months. They don't even have any health insurance. Hmm. So the local league, yeah, we 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 have to change the whole system. We have to find out what works for us. And how we can fit it into the modern football, and it, that's it. If we do that, we get a quality product on the pitch, and then trust me, they will come running. They will come running for like, oh, please let us sponsor, please let us do this. But right now, it's just terrible. So we should stop the politics, stop the politics, stop that whole bureaucracy stuff, and just just go on with trying to improve football. Hmm. The conciliary. The conciliary has spoken, talking about quitting the politics and focusing on the football itself. Tell me about young Ghanaian players that excite you now. Who who excites you to watch now when you turn on your TV? Like local TV? Uh, no, in, I mean in, Ghana generally, yes. in general, Europe, Ghana, locally, um, everywhere. Um, Kudus. Ah, tell me about him. I, what I, about I, him? I, play, I played against him. Um, 
uh, there's this Ghanaian player in Birmingham, Alabama, called Prosper. He and uh, what's the name of that kid in Austria? Majid Ashmeri. Majid Ashmeri. Yeah. yeah, they have this game, charity game, Prosper Eleven and Ashmeri Majid Eleven. Uh, they play at Nima Kaukuri Park, so they invited me to go play. And uh, I watched the kid. That was the first time I've seen him like, actually watch him play. And I was like, yeah, he got some. Him, Kudus, Ashmeru is one of them. And um, um, oh, some of them I know by their faces. I'm not yeah. good with it. Yeah, I'm not good with the names, but. Yeah. Just briefly touch on Kudus to Ajax for me. What did you make of that whole transfer, make it, making the move from Nordjylland to Ajax? Great move, great move. And if he keeps his head down, humble, and ready to learn, that's a big step. From Ajax, where do you go? You, you, don't, you can't get lower than that. I know players, young players from Sweden that got, that got signed by Ajax, but then off the field stuff ruined them. But on the pitch, you go into a team that gives chances to young players. You know what I mean? So, and if you watch Kudu's games, this is exactly what they need. That box to box number eight. Like, he could pass, he could dribble, he could score, he's strong. He's technically gifted. Like, I mean, what can you say? Sometimes I feel like he could release the ball quicker, but then he finds a way to get out of those situations. You get what I mean? So, you just have to live with it. Just have to understand him and let him do him. And uh, I think that was the best move. I don't. I don't know how true that Liverpool move was. And I was <laughs> just well, you never know because you know his agent and his media. Yeah. I don't know much about it, but he. It, you cannot say anything bad about the move. Whoever, whatever agent who helped him with it, congrats to him and God bless him. Hmm. Now, like I said earlier, if I'm talking to the conciliary as you are known on your social I media, I need to get a few, I need to get some insights onto what you've been doing except football. Tell me about reading and books you could possibly recommend in terms of what you've been reading and what you've been getting into. I don't do, I don't do hard cover. Okay. Like if, it, if, it, book, yeah, if it's an e-book, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, e-books, books, whatever. Yeah. Right now, I'm reading a uh, I'm reading a book from a, a friend of mine, um, Devotion for Entrepreneurs. Okay. That, that, that's what I'm reading. I try to read a chapter every day. And then uh, um, most of the time, they are, they are just journals or articles from the New York Times. I'm, I, I, I like everything. You know, I'm not, I'm not just about sports. Yeah. I thought, but I'm not I'm not yeah. the one that you yeah. So I read I read about what's going on, I read about the financial market, I read about politics and uh, I, I watch documentaries a lot. Mm. I see you like yeah. your music as well. You like some hip hop. I've seen yeah. you make a few references here and there. Who are, who are your favorite rappers <laughs> out there? If it ain't rapping, I'm not listening. <laughs> who are your favorite rappers? Tell me about that. Whoa, right now, well, I still listen to Ross. I still listen to Sakodian. I don't listen to Sakodian Afrobeats. Uh. Yeah, if, it, yeah, if it's on the hip hop beat, yeah. And uh, I listen to. Oof, well, it's a long list. <laughs> no, give me a, a few. Give me a few. Just throw a few out uh, there. Uh, Ross, Wayne, DMX, Pop Smoke. Uh, I like Strongman. Ah, nice. I still bump, I still bump to, I still bump to a brand for, and uh, like this new, new, new guys. I don't really listen to because I'm, I'm, I'm not really a big fan of the mumble rap. But yeah. I like the one who created it, which is Future. So I'll listen to Future, of course, and then of course the the usual ones, Nas, Hov, Eminem. So if it ain't rapping, of course gospel song, I'm a Christian. But I said that <laughs> yeah. anything else. I'm like, I would, if I go to a pub or a bar in Ghana, they play your Afrobeat, of course. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, you wouldn't play that in my car. I know, I know, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Tell me about <laughs> eating Ghanaian food in Sweden. Just finally, before we wrap up the interview, what, what kind of Ghanaian food are you capable of cooking for yourself <laughs> up there in Sweden? 
wow, you're going to make, make me say this in public because I'm a terrible cook. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not actually, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's, everybody knows that. I have a guy in friend who, who helps me out. He's really good. And, yeah. And for me, I don't, I'm not really big on that unless one day I'm really craving something. But whatever he cooks, he goes. Anything that I need is fine with me. Fufu Banku, anything works for you? Yeah, well, no, nah, Fufu, I'll eat in Ghana. <laughs> okay, cool. I understand that. Now, yeah. just, just before you go, I, I did see that you have retired from international football, meaning that you've exempted yourself from possible national team action. But what's happening on the club scene? Are you still open to playing? Your last move, like I said, uh, was with Polisar. Well, with, with the club, yeah, I think I'm fine with everything. I, I think this is the first time I'm saying this publicly. I've said it to friends, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fine with everything. Like, if I have an opportunity comes, I'm fine. I still train. I'm ready to play. But... I'm fine with focusing on sports administration. So it's like whichever one comes. So, but obviously, I'm going to give it to it. it with the football side, it's going to be a time limit. Once that time passes, yeah, I'm officially done playing football. But at the moment, I'm fit. I'm not injured. I'm training. So, mm. but then also, if, if I get an opportunity to intern with a football club here or whatever, I'm, I'm totally fine. I'm happy with my career. Hmm. So you, wait, you, you're getting more into management now, not necessarily coaching, just before we go. Uh, just, I don't know if you know Justin Adder. He's been trying to tell me to get into coaching. No. You right sound now, like I, a coach talking to you. I, I coach um, the team, the, 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 the local team that I, is a division three, four team in Sweden. I train with them and I coach too. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I coach. Uh, yeah, it's fun actually. It, it, that's that's one of the reasons why I want to get my badges someday. It's it's really fun coaching, and I'll, it's something I'll do. I'll do, but is it a prior? Is it like the main thing? I don't know yet. I don't know. Okay, okay, okay. I have a degree, and then I have the football. So I thank God that I have options. Yeah. I like I like I like options too. Ruben, thanks for <laughs> making time to speak to us here on the track. I'm sure I can ask a few more questions if we both decide to stay on, but time won't yes. permit us. But I appreciate the time shared with us. Hopefully, some other time we can catch up. Of course. Thank you very much. So you heard the man Ruben Ayana getting to <coughs> us all the way from Sweden, sharing his story right from Ghana to the United States and then to Sweden. And now he's veering more into football management. You know where the stop is when you want to get all the details on Ghanaian players around the world. It's the tracker on City TV. Same time next week, we'll be right here.